Corporate America wants to dehumanize you and turn you into a human resource. But that's actually a good thing. Amazon workers in St. Peter's join workers around the country and the world. Every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer, because you guys paid for all of this. The mass layoffs continue at Facebook's parent company, Meta. Slashing employee headcount be the driver to a strong year for tech. It ain't fair to us working like we working and got him in this position he in and he don't care about us and want to pay us. The most expensive and difficult part of running any business is managing the workers. Companies can achieve great success just by hiring the right talent, even if their product offering is below the standard of competitors. Companies can also fail if they hire bad employees, even if the rest of the business outclasses their competitors. The success of any business hinges on a group with diametrically opposed motivations to the owners. As an employee, you want to be paid a lot of money, but your company wants to pay you as little as it can. As an employee, you want to work flexible hours, but your company wants you to be available at all times just in case something comes up. And as an employee, you want to work in a comfortable working environment, but your company wants everybody to give up working from home to come into open plan offices that are cheaper than giving people space and privacy. Back before World War I, the opposition between employers and employees was not kept a secret. The new industrialists demanded long hours in dangerous factories, and the workers pushed back through organized and often violent strikes. The industrialists still had the upper hand, because they could easily hire able-bodied men from farm work that paid less. After, the war skills became more important, and just being able-bodied was not enough to work in the most mechanized factories in the early 20th century. Skilled labor unions were gaining the upper hand. The industrialists needed a new approach to ensure that they could keep getting the most out of their workers, and so human resources was born. The first HR department was formed in 1901 by the National Cash Register Company. They called it the Personnel Management Department, and it was formed in response to several organized staff walkouts and strikes over working conditions and pay. The National Cash Register Company employed workers skilled in arithmetic to keep books for regional banks before electronic computers. The people working on the floor of this business were actually called computers. That was their job title. The automated adding machines that came later would be named after them. But that's a story for how history works. The new personnel management department was established to do three things. One, train management on new workplace laws and policies. Two, handle hiring and firing of workers. And three, mediate workplace grievances between employees and managers. What the company had done was privatize the labor union and bring it directly under their control while making it appear as if they were doing this all for the good of their employees. Because the National Cash Register Company employed skilled workers that were hard to train and replace, their new personnel management department made sense to be the new prototype HR department. But 120 years later, nothing has changed. When Starbucks, Amazon, and Walmart fight against worker unionization, they say that a union will just get in the way of working directly with the company to resolve worker grievances. We have workers' councils, of course, and we have very good communications with our employees. So we don't believe that we need a union to be an intermediary between us and our employees. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, it's always the employee's choice. No matter how they present themselves, human resources works for the company. They want to turn you into a resource that's cheap, hardworking, and doesn't complain. But the best part is that this can easily be used to your advantage. What? <laughs> so it's time to learn how money works to find out why corporate America trying to dehumanize you is actually a good thing. This week's lesson was sponsored by Brilliant. Being an effective employee requires a good set of skills and knowledge, and Brilliant is an excellent platform for developing these skills. In today's world, understanding artificial intelligence is crucial, but if you're not familiar with it, you could be left behind. But don't worry, Brilliant is here to help. Brilliant offers courses in artificial neural networks and reinforcement learning that are perfect for beginners. I've personally taken these courses and I can confidently say that they've deepened my understanding of machine learning and AI. Studying with Brilliant encourages interactive learning. You get to put your newfound knowledge into practice, which helps you remember the information better. Brilliant has managed to make learning fun and enjoyable. It feels less like a tedious school assignment and more like a fascinating journey into the world of knowledge that you can embark on with just a few clicks. Whether you want to broaden your horizons or just keep your mind sharp, Brilliant has you covered. Their engaging and practical approach to learning allows you to stay curious and informed. To get Brilliant for free for 30 days, go to brilliant.org forward slash howmoneyworks or click the link in the description and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. The role of human resources has grown a lot from the National Cash Register Company's personal management department. 
human resources still acts as a way for companies to keep their workers satisfied enough to not unionize. But they have additionally taken on the role of workplace enforcers and negotiators. It's a shitty system, but I am not here to complain about it. I am here to tell you how to take advantage of it. Salary negotiations are the most important thing you will do when picking a job or choosing to stay or leave your current job. Being good at salary negotiations can be better for your career than being good at your job. Managers expect that strong candidates will negotiate their salary when they apply for a new role. The Harvard Business School Salary Negotiation Guide and a report by Robert Half, a workplace analytics firm, found that managers actually favored applicants that asked for salaries that were higher but still reasonable. If you are willing to accept any offer, you will be seen as desperate or unqualified for the job that is on offer. Where if you negotiate hard, you are not only showing that you think you are good enough for the job on offer, you are also showing that you can be assertive and confident in a high pressure situation. A company always wants to pay its employees as little as it can, but hiring managers managers and human resources departments that handle onboarding and salary negotiations are not the same as the company. They have their own motivations too. There are really three parties you need to satisfy when you want a job at a large company. The manager you'll be working for, the HR manager, and the least important is the company itself. Most people try too hard trying to prove what a valuable resource they will be to the company, which is a bad strategy. The company wants someone who will work very hard for very little. Instead, a better strategy is to use the systems that the company has built against it. A human resource manager is still just an employee as well. To impress them, just make it as easy as possible for them to go through their employee onboarding checklist and salary negotiations framework. These people don't really want to hear about your passion for data entry. They want to get the whole thing over and done with as quickly as possible so they can go to their own boss and show them how many hires they made this month that fit the corporate mandated guidelines. Large companies all have standardized hiring processes now because they want to acquire human resources of a predictable quality and avoid looking like they hire people based on any factors other than their legally approved selection criteria. If big companies only hired people based on the discretion of a manager in an interview alone, they could make themselves liable of charges of discrimination, and it would be more likely that bad employees could give in a job through a friend or a daily member. To avoid this, companies have created highly redundant onboarding processes that require interviews with multiple departments and standardized testing. If you have ever wondered why modern companies require so many rounds of interviews now, this is the reason. A drawn-out interview process also eliminates candidates who are not willing to jump through all of the ropes to get a job. To justify this practice, HR departments will say that this means that they are only left with the most dedicated candidates, but reports suggest that who they are actually left with are just the most desperate candidates. There are two real reasons why you will likely go through as many as five rounds of interviews when applying for a new job. The first reason is plain and simple bad managers who want to qualify a candidate, then see if they would be a good fit for the role, and then negotiate salary all in separate interviews. It's a beginner's guide to outdated business power moves. All of these discussions could be had in one interview and some follow-up phone calls. The second reason that hiring managers have kept adding more interviews to the hiring process is because multiple rounds of interviews are a useful way of safely getting rid of applicants that HR or the hiring manager doesn't like. In four rounds of interviews, a practical assignment, and a screening quiz, there will always be something to justify picking one candidate over another, so the company and its managers can protect themselves against accusations of discrimination. For example, if someone shows up to a job interview heavily pregnant and talks about how they can't wait to be a stay-at-home mom, an employer can't not hire them based on that information alone because that would be discrimination against a protected class of people. If the employer doesn't want to hire someone that is only going to work for two months before quitting to raise a child, they can just use any other data point from the extended application process to show that they were a weaker candidate than someone else. A system that was set up to avoid unfair hiring practices became the best excuse for doing it. The next person you have to impress is the manager you will actually be working for, because as soon as the HR manager can tick all of their boxes, they are normally the ones that get to pick the winner. What they really want to know is are you going to make them look good? Are you going to make their job easier or harder? Those points are aligned with the interests of the company, but they are not the same. A manager wants someone who is going to work hard, but they would prefer an average worker to an above average worker if the average worker won't cause problems. People get fired all the time for making complaints or undermining their managers even if the issues they raise were in the best interest of the company. Over your career, keeping a good relationship with your managers and colleagues will be much more valuable than impressing a corporation by going over your boss's head. Future employers are not going to want to speak with the shareholders of your past company. They will want to speak with your old boss. Having a glowing recommendation ticks off a lot of boxes for the HR manager and means a new potential boss can hire you with confidence. 
Complaints handling and enforcement is another tool that corporate America has used to systematically dehumanize its employees. The Modern Human Resources Department has taken over most workplace complaints handling as one of its main responsibilities. This used to be a job for normal managers or, in serious cases, a union or the authorities. But if all complaints are directed towards HR, it gives the company the advantage of hearing about issues and dealing with them before anybody else. For regular workplace drama, it's a good system. But for more serious problems, you need to remember that human resources works for the company. They do not work for you. Any complaint that will pit you against the company and its shareholders is not the right complaint to take to HR. That would be like getting legal advice from a police officer trying to arrest you. Employees that frequently complain to HR go on the list to be terminated first in the next round of layoffs when they happen. It's rarely worth raising issues with HR, because it annoys your manager if it ever gets back to them, and it annoys the regular people working in a shitty department that have to process the complaints. The same two people that will be responsible for your salary negotiations or internal promotions if you ever pursue that. One rare case when you can use this system to your advantage is a real unethical life pro tip. But if you think you are about to be fired, then making a complaint to HR can make that very hard for the company to do without it looking like a retaliation, which is illegal. To your company, you are a human resource, but the systems they have created can easily be used to your advantage to make yourself the most valuable resource you can possibly be. Make sure you are always selling your time to the highest bidder. Market yourself well, and remember to keep the people that decide your salary happy, even if they are the same people that want to talk to you about corporate culture. Go and watch my video on that next to find out why corporate America has become so obsessed with this buzzword. A special thanks again to Brilliant for making it possible for everybody to keep on learning how money works.